Hello, welcome to Adapt Enclis, a place of knowledge pack and commonly tested information on your Enclis. Um, today, I'll be talking about very important aspects of your test, anticoagulation, antiplatelets, especially endocarditis. This is very, very common in your test because a lot of people are on these medications that affect and, uh, coagulation and therefore be likely to ask you questions on it. It's a teaching question, prioritization question, SATA question, um, teaching, everything you can think of. So let's get to it. Anticoagulation. So briefly, I always try to explain why we have this problem. So anticoagulation, that means we're trying to make our blood very thin. There's something wrong that um, we need to do in order to make our blood very thin. We don't want it to clot anymore all of a sudden. And there's a reason for that. So we take this medication, anticoagulation. So coagulation, there's factors that, numerous factors, they can start from one all the way to like 12, I mean, a bunch of them that control coagulation. And there's so many medications that can affect the pathways. Um, Coumadin, for example, warfarin is a rat poison. Um, that's why it's very dangerous. And so these medications are designed to prevent you from forming clots. And so there's a bunch of them. There's um, fact that um, vitamin K dependent. So this is a vitamin K dependent anticoagulation. There's a indirect factor 10, that's heparin, um, lovonos or azanoprine, and which is the same as lovonos, low molecular um, weight heparin. Um, so this is another name, and there's a prine. Uh, low molecular weight heparin is an heparin, which is also um, the indirect thrombin inhibitor. And then factor 10, there's a bunch of them that will go through. So these are the four classes of anticoagulation. I don't think it matters that much. The only thing that matters is to be able to distinguish warfarin and heparin and when do you use these factors. So we'll tackle each of them and then we talk about them. So warfarin is the same thing as coumadin. So if they give you this medication, coumadin, that's warfarin, okay? It block, like I said, certain factors in the coagulation pathway. Factor two, this one you have to know. Factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10, and sometimes protein C and S. These are what we call vitamin K dependent, dependent factors. That means these factors need vitamin K to do their function. So what coumadin does is it block these factors. And therefore, uh, these particular factors are involved in your uh, prothrombin time, so PT time, and they also affect your INR. So if um, coumadin or warfarin affect this, it increases it. So that's what it does. Um, it takes about two to five days for it to work. So when you start in coumadin, it, it takes two to five days. Because of that, and because of this factor, the protein C and S, this is very important. Because of this level, you need to start them on heparin first. So heparin first, together with coumadin or warfarin. And then after five days, when coumadin has attained or warfarin has attained its therapeutic range, then you stop heparin. So you can start no way. This is a testable question. No way. You cannot put anybody on coumadin right away. 
you need to bridge them. We call it bridge them with heparin. So they are on heparin IV. So most of the time they are in the hospital, they will be on heparin. We'll talk about heparin uh, for a couple of days while they're taking the coumadin and then uh, you wean them off of um, the heparin. So you cannot start coumadin with that heparin because of these, um, because of the time it takes to take effect and because of this, especially protein C and S, they will have skin necrosis. So skin necrosis. So they are, uh, in their lower extremities, they, they, they have necrosis. So that tissue will die. There will be area of the skin that will die. Because of that, so we call it coumadin induced skin necrosis because you do not start them on heparin. And because the protein C and S get chewed up so quickly and then they develop necrosis. So you have to start them on heparin drip, then coumadin or warfarin, and then you tape out them off from it. The, the, the certain things you have to know about coumadin, okay? Anybody that you want to put them on warfarin or coumadin, I interchange it. Usually your I and R, everybody, if you don't have any problem that you, you're not going to take coumadin is one. Your PT is 10, is 11 to 12.2, 12.5, sorry. When they put you on coumadin, so plus coumadin, your INR, you have to multiply by, so you multiply by two to three. So one times two is two. One times three is three. So the INR become, um, I now become two to three. So that's why this is the therapeutic range for somebody who is on coumadin or warfarin. If they are not on anything, it's one. The same thing, the PT, uh, uh, usually everybody is 11 to 12.5. So you multiply this, the same thing by two, um, the, 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 the multiplication is slightly different. You multiply it by 1.5 to 2. So this times 1.5, I think it's 16.5. This is almost, and 2 times 12.5 is 24, so close to 25. So you will, we will say 16 to 25. So if somebody is on coumadin, his INR is two to three, and his PT is 16 to 25. So you have to know this number so that you know when they give you a question, you know if it's wrong or not. The one that they always like to ask, if you have a prosthetic valve, so prosthetic valve, so somebody have a heart valve, and they need, or mechanical, so this is mechanical no biological, mechanical, prosthetic valve, and indeed uh, anticoagulation because the valve usually when the blood goes around it, it can irritate it and it cause you know, clot formation. So they need some, something to thin their blood so that they don't form clot. Um, because of that, um, these people, they, you have to make their blood extra thin. So you don't multiply it the high and high, you don't multiply by 2.2 2 or to 3, you, multi you multiply by 2.5 to 3.5. So the I and I has to be 2.5 to, uh, 2 to 3.5. If they don't have prosthetic valve, it should be 2 to 3. If they, don't, they have prosthetic valve, it's 2.5 to 3.5. So these numbers you have to know. So that is the values um, that is very important. Now, guess what? They can ask you so many questions. Okay. Patients in anticoagulation, you make their blood very thin. What do you think? Well, they're going to bleed, bleeding precaution. So 
So this is your SATA right there, teaching or education. And this apply to Eprin, Lovonos, and Nozoprin, all of them. These anti-coagulation, it apply to all of them. So let's let's see if we can list them without thinking about it. We can memorize it, not thinking, without no memorizing. So we know we have to cause bleeding. Their blood is very thin, they're going to bleed easily. So what do you do? Well, you tell them to avoid falling. And if they have to fall, they have to make sure their room is clean. So there should no be rags on the floor. Otherwise, when they fall, they bang their head and then they bleed. What else? Some people have to shave. So if you go to shave, you make sure you use clippers. Clippers is the same thing like the electric, electric razors. No regular shaving. This one is electric, so you don't have to cut yourself with the blade. Okay, so no razor blade alone, just electrical one. And then when you have to brush your teeth, you got to make sure they're using very soft ones. So soft Bristol toothbrush. Okay, so that they don't bleed, they will bleed easily. I know we all floss. They can do floss. They usually you should you should encourage them to floss, but they can do that. If you see the question and they put waxed, usually the waxed uh, floss is fine. If they put waxed floss, it's okay, but no regular floss. So waxing that one is fine. So usually they can they can when they flux in they have to use waxed one. Um, the other thing too is they should avoid anything that will cause them to bleed, like NSAID. So don't take Motrin, okay? If you have pain, don't take Motrin because you're going to bleed. So NSAID should be avoided. No no aspirin, okay? If they need pain medication, Tylenol is good. So take Tylenol instead of NSAID or aspirin. So they shouldn't they shouldn't take it at all. It's not good. Okay. And they should, what do you think? These people are at risk of bleeding. So when they fall, they will bleed. Uh, they come to the hospital, you draw blood, they're going to bleed. So they should have a lead bracelet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that everybody know that they're taking anticoagulation so that when they fall, extra precaution um, will be, um, it will ensure that they, they don't have a massive bleeding. Warfarin is usually um, metabolized by the liver. So what do you think? That you shouldn't take any medication that affect the liver. So no med affect the liver, even though they can take down also, um, they should avoid like, Alcohol, alcohol is not good for them. Okay, so those are some of the things um, specific for that. The, the one that they like, I told you warfarin is a vitamin K, okay, dependent, that's what it blocks. So, of course, the, you'll be tricking. You say, well, if I'm blocking vitamin K, I should take more vitamin K, increase by vitamin K. No. Your vitamin K intake should be same, same, don't increase this. This is a little bit confusing. So when you take coumadin, so this is coumadin, okay? It's blocking vitamin K dependent factors, okay? So we want them to stay at the same amount of vitamin K factors in the system so that we can, we know how to block it. If they increases the vitamin K intake or they decrease it abruptly, it will make the coumadin not work and it will be difficult for us to trace it. So this is a very key information. If you eat your vitamin K, if you're taking two grams, or I'm using an example, two total milli equivalent of vitamin K a day, well, it should remain the same if, when you are in coumadin. So you tell them, don't increase too much diet that has vitamin K. And these are the vitamin K um, 
a couple of them I can remember vitamin K dependent um fruit yeah, diet that you have vitamin K like broccoli you know broccoli has vitamin K and uh, freshy um vegetables okay leafy break I mean, freshy leafy leafy vegetables um have a lot of vitamin K in them uh spinach um spinach has a lot of vitamin K okay and then I think cabbage too cabbage too has vitamin K in it um and liver okay so you got to know some of this you can check the internet and you can find food that adds vitamin K but this is I think the most common one I remember broccoli and uh, vegetables that is green yeah green and uh, spinach cabbage and liver they shouldn't increase them or decrease them so whatever amount they used to take every day they should stay with it keep on taking the same thing then my favorite okay which everybody does it i call them the four g's it's common we have it we can find it everywhere um you go to the um the herbal uh, uh, and shops you go and get them it's easy people can go and get them they go to the walmart they can get them over the counter and i call it them four g's but they are dangerous so garlic okay four g's garlic ginger okay ginkgo and ginseng these are all herbal medication that can increase bleeding risks with cumidine. So they should avoid all the four Gs. Don't take any of them. Otherwise, you're going to bleed more. So avoid them. This is very, very important. Avoid all the four Gs. Whenever you see these Gs uh, in your test, if you start with the G, pick it. Garlic, ginger, ginkgo, and ginseng. They shouldn't take it. The other ones that is common, you see how this medication, that's why they can test you. There's so many things about it and you can make a mistake. And because it's so common, people take it and then they get into trouble. There's certain uh, uh, diet they shouldn't, not diet, juice and uh, stuff that they shouldn't eat at all. Okay, cranberry. Uh, I always, from medical to know that cranberry juice is bad. It's not, it's not good. It affects medications and other things. So you don't take them. Grape juice, the same thing. Okay, you can, ask, you can even ask grape juice to this. So there will be five Gs. Grape juice, you shouldn't take it. So these are drinks. That's why I put them on the side. It's also green tea. And um, so those are the one they should really, really, really avoid it. Otherwise, it become a problem. So these, these four, and of course, alcohol. They shouldn't drink alcohol. So don't drink cranberry juice. Don't drink grapes. You can add the G grapes and green tea to the four Gs here. You get the C C Gs right there. And then alcohol. They shouldn't do that. This is why the examiners can ask you so many things, but you just have to like put it in your mind. What is the actual problem? Well, this all affect uh, something cytochrome enzymes in the uh, liver that used to metabolize. I don't want to bother you too much. CYP it has some thirty some weird name by cytochrome. You don't need to know that. Basically, it affects that enzyme, so metabolism of that changes. And so you should tell them not to um, take any of this. So you get them down and you'll be fine. The, the other one is that is big is pregnancy, okay? If they on, is that teratogen, okay? Is it teratogen? So he... You, when you're pregnant, you can't take coumadin. So no coumadin in pregnancy because it causes fetal problem. And so you should put them on heparin. And that's what they like to ask. So a pregnant lady come in with a DVT and they need anticoagulation. 
well, you cannot give them cumin. So you put them on um, heparin first, then later on you give them other anticoagulation. There's other options um, that they can take. Once again, don't increase your vitamin K. I'm keep on saying that because that's what they're going to ask. Take the same amount because that's what the patient, oh, I'm taking uh, Coumadin, let me increase my vitamin K. No, don't do that. Stay the same diet that you used to have, okay? There's um a few um thing I want to add. Um, this one, some medication. Some medication will make you bleed may make coumadin bleeding and then some that doesn't uh, decrease the effectiveness of that okay decrease the effectiveness of that because of that um when you're taking them you have to be careful so something like NSAID if you take it you bleed more okay antibiotic also affects so if they give you choices antibiotic is never good with coumadin and uh, uh, SSR also are not good with coumadin. And then sometimes the um, the reflux medication, so omeprazole, okay, PPI. PPI is not good. This uh, PPI is not good. So these four, PPI, SSR, antibiotic, they're usually not good. They make you bleed more. The other ones that doesn't make you uh, coumadin work. So basically coumadin, you need more coumadin to do its effect because it decreases the effectiveness is oral contraception. So if they're taking birth control, okay, anybody who's taking birth control that is in coumadin, tell them you need um, barrier method. So they need condom or maybe um, diaphragm. Otherwise, um, they're going to get pregnant. It doesn't allow uh, birth control to work well. And like I said, they shouldn't take vitamin K. They should take the same amount that they used to take. Don't increase or decrease it. And the four Gs we talk about. So those are medications you can you can add it to. Um, in the the back of your mind to know if they ask you a question look at it carefully especially antibiotic you shouldn't be taking it and said you shouldn't be taking it and ppi if i don't remember anything those ones you should there's because there's interactions is broken down by the liver So heparin is the same, it does the same thing as coumadin, except it's not vitamin K dependent. So this is heparin also causes you, um, it, it's anticoagulation. So it makes your blood very thin, but it do different thing. So it binds to something we call thrombin, and then the thrombin binds to factor 10. So this is indirect binding. And then that causes um, um, the anticoagulating effect of heparin. Um, so it's indirect um, a way of doing that. Because of that, it affects uh, partial thromboplastin time. So we call it PTT instead of the PT. So there's different. The normal PTT is 25 to 35. And it's the same thing. Uh, therapeutic, okay, if you're taking heparin, you multiply this by 1.5 and 2. So you multiply the lower one by 1.5, the upper one by 2, and you get 46 and 70. So this is the therapeutic range. Um, this is the therapeutic range that you have to know the normal because they will give you a normal and you have to know it's within this range, 46 and and seven eight. when they are on anticoagulation, it, um, if they are not, it's 25 to 35, okay? It comes in two forms. There's a sub-Q form and there's the IV form. The sub-Q is for prophylaxis, so don't fall for it. This is, is prophylaxis. That means it's preventing DVT when you are in the hospital. 
okay? And usually it's like 5,000 units. It's sub-Q and you inject it like every eight hours. It's different from the IV. IV is a drip that you get. So usually patient doesn't go home with the sub-Q or the IV. This is usually used in the hospital. So heparin, sub-Q, and then heparin IV. The way they trick you is the sub-Q. When you're on sub-Q, you don't need to check your PTT. There is no need, no lab work. Okay, very, very important that you know when they're getting heparin sub-Q, they don't need any lab, no lab. Lab is not necessary. It's the drip. When you're on the drip, you got to check the PTT, okay? And you titrate it. So you titrate it to maintain in the range 46 to 70. You just basically have to keep it in the range. So once again, don't fall for them when they say sub Q, somebody is getting sub Q heparin, you got to check their lab. There is no lab work, it's only the drip. So for the drip, they can trick you. Somebody is in the drip and it's PTT, you check it's PTT, it's like 100, what do you do? Where well, this is way above the normal. So you got to stop it right away. The good thing about heparin is it's half-life, which is T, half, it's very quick, it's less than, it's like almost like 90 minutes. So it's very quick. As soon as you stop it, um, within a short time, the level, your body clear it out. So it has a very short half-life. So if it's PTT is high, you need to stop it. But you have to know the normal multiplied by 1.5 to 2. Sometimes they will say PTT is 1.5 to 2 of the normal. Yeah, that's what they mean. And that decreases it. So that's very important. So heparin. Um, the other thing too is, is the same precaution, okay? You have to take same precaution. I'm not going to list them, but that also bleeding precaution. So it doesn't matter what they give you, you're going to use the same thing for that. The trick is there's no diet. I'm going to write it in capital letters. Well, that's not capital letters. No diet modification because there is no vitamin K dependence. So don't fall for that. If they also put there in the SATA question, there's no diet problem. You don't need any diet problem. Um, the, if you have overdose, so somebody PTT maybe is like uh, 200 and they're bleeding, the overdose, you have to know this name here, okay? Poromine sulfate. So poromine sulfate is what you give it to the patient to uh, bind to heparin, basically it, it, it take them from binding to and uh, probing to do its effect. So protamine sulfate is the antidote for heparin. I forgot to mention the antidote for coumadin should be what? Well, if it's a vitamin K dependent factor, it's blocking vitamin K, then increase vitamin K. So you can give them vitamin K. So somebody bleeding too much from coumadin, give them vitamin K. Somebody bleeding too much from heparin, give them protamine sulfate. It's like one gram, then you're done. Okay. The, the testable question on heparin, which will be like maybe prioritization question, prioritization, is somebody that you put them in heparin. And then... Uh, within a short time, five, six days, uh, usually your platelet is like 15,000, no, 150,000 to 400,000. You put them on heparin and five days later, if their heparin was 200,000, you put them on heparin, it will cut it into half. Now their heparin is 100,000. This is what we call heparin induce thrombocytopenia hit so h i t t there's two types there's type one and type two this basically i just want to let you know in case they give you time if you occur within four 
four days, that one is mild. It will go away. That's type one. Type two, you're okay after five days. So five days, yeah, this is the bad one. Type two. So when you give put somebody on heparin, five days, their platelet is half, then that's heat. If it's within four days, you don't need to do the uh, Usually it will take care of itself. It happened a little bit, then you stabilize. But after five days, that's type two. And you have to do something about it. This is being sharp. It's thrombosis and hemorrhage. The reason why it's very important is because of what happened. So this is a, an immune effect. So your body is basically fighting against the heparin and now it's affecting the platelet. And you have 50% decrease in your platelets. Okay. The problem is you give this for people to bleed. So you give heparin for bleeding. No, for bleeding. To, um, so you give to people so that you can make their blood very thin. So it's an anticoagulation. When they develop HITT, it's opposite. The problem, the problem, once again, the problem is thrombosis. So you have to watch them. They may have stroke. So they get a DVT and stroke. So that's why this is all PE. So when you develop heat, every induced thrombocytopenia, you don't bleed, you rather form clots because the platelet is too small and form and clumps of platelet and they block your system, your vascular system. And therefore you have a DVT stroke and PEs. That's why this is very important. This has to be your priority patient. If you see that patient, that's prioritization. They're going to shock, they can have airway issue. And so that patient, you have to be sharp about it. So that's why we do that. How do you treat it? Treatment is very important. So you stop the heparin, of course, and you let the ACP know, you, so you call the doctor, okay? And then, the, 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 the something that everybody forget, most of your IV tubings, most of your IV tubings, most of your IV tubings, IV tubings, uh, So the IV tubing, most IV tubing are impregnated with heparin so that it doesn't cause thrombosis. And people always forget about it. You got to stop all of it. No more. So stop all of them. Stop all IV impregnated tubing you know, because that also contain heparin on the patient who have heparin induced thrombocytopenia. You have to do that. You got to check some labs to see what is their platelet are. So you get a CBC. Then people always forget this, the lower molecular weight heparin, which you familiar with is enosaparin, enosaparin. That is low bonus in case they give you, I think in your test, they will put this one there, enosaparin. This is also heparin, but it's a lower molecular, he has the H there, heparin. You stop it, stop it, stop enoxaparin. Okay, you have to stop it. Then somebody will say, well, patient need anticoagulation, then they, they're going to get stroke and DVT because that's the complication. They're going to get DVT, stroke, and a PE. So how are you going to anticoagulate them? Well, you give them another one. You can give them warfarin, Oh, the other ones which we'll talk about, they have last name as Saban or 
Gatoba. I'm not going to list them because I don't remember all of them. There's a bunch of them. They are poison. So they, all you need to do is remember the last name and you can recognize them. They have Gat, uh, Gatron or Gatroban. They are Gatroban and Zaban. So last name is Zaban. And the other one is Gatobans. So when you see them, they are also anticoagulation. They, they are factor 10 inhibitors, direct factor 10 inhibitors. So the special ones um, is a newer generation of um, medications. So they are non-heparin. So you're giving them non-heparin anticoagulation. So Lubinons, hey, Warfarin, Zabans, and Gatobans. So this is the management of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Stop the heparin, call the doctor, uh, stop all IV impregnated heparin, get CVC for the, to check their platelet. You also have to do neurovascular check because they're going to get stroke. So you need to check on them, neurovascular check, and make sure they are not bleeding, they're getting stroke. Um, and then stop. Um, lower molecular heparin, which is a, a nasoprene, which is lovonos, and put them on gatoban or xapan. So when they give you a question, somebody has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, what medication will you put them is one of them. Something that has zaban or gatoban. And so that's the, 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 the management of that. And this is the other ones I was talking about. They they different. They have last name of Zabans and Ga. Um, I forget Gatrons. Yeah, you can you can the Gatrons. Okay, um, that's their name. So their last name or uh, Zabans or Gatrons. Um, they are factor ten inhibitors. You don't have to memorize them or they. There's nothing special about them. Just to remember them because you see this pharmacological question and you have no clue where they are. The best way is to look at the last name. You know, they all have Zabans and Gatrans. Zabans and Gatrans. They are factor 10 inhibitor. Nothing has changed. The precautions are all the same. Bleeding, I'm talking about bleeding precaution. No NSAIDs and soft brush. No contact sports, okay? Okay, no contact sports, all those things. Um, no rags. So the same precautions, um, shaving. They should be careful, use electrical shaver. Um, they, they should basically avoid contact sports, like I said, they shouldn't take NSAIDs. Okay, no aspirin or anything like that that will make them bleed. You know, they should have um, alert bracelets. It's the same thing. This is specific, it's, it's not specific, it's generalized for all of them. Okay, and they should, it should avoid the four Gs. The same thing. Specifically for this one, there is no, the one that will trick you, like the heparin, no diet issue. You don't need any diet issue. And you don't need any lab work, no lab work. You don't need to check any lab work and see what is the PTT or INI. No, you don't need it. Unlike the Coumadin, they have to do that. So there's no frequent lab check on this patient. So when they give you these questions, just know that's how they can trick you and see if you understand what these factors are. These ones, they don't need any lab work. They don't need any frequent lab work. Um, they don't need to modify their diet. They can eat whatever they have. Coumadin, yes, um, there's and certain things, they, but they have to keep their vitamin K uh, constant. So you have to like be able to, uh, at the back of your mind, to figure out what you think they will trick you with. So just pay attention. Before we go, let me go back and to the... The, the heparin. So we talk about the one portion, one the lower molecular heparin. I think um, they like asking that. So 
this enosaparin. This is lovonoids. This is injection and heparin. Um, usually when you're giving heparin injection, sometimes lovonoids, both of them, if this is the individual and this is the belly button, you usually give it like near the uh, umbilicus, like two centimeters, okay? Away from the belly button. So two centimeters in the abdomen, either left or right, but just lateral to the umbilicus, just go away two centimeters from it. And then this is fundamental. You can do it 45 degrees or 90 degrees. I just remember that I need to, I think it's very important. They can ask you. 45 if it's normal person. If they're obese and you can pinch it at least two centimeters of fat in your hand, yeah, then this is for obese patient. So be careful. When they give you 45, yes, because sub-Q, you're giving this by sub-Q injection. And sub-Q injection, you can do 45 degrees angle, 90 degrees angle. 90 degrees if they're obese and 45 if it's normal. Obese means you can pinch up to 22 centimeter of the abdominal wall. Um, you don't massage when you give it. And you don't aspirate either. Aspiration, no, 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 no. So that is what um, they, they can ask you. And you have to rotate side, rotate side. Otherwise they, they will bleed and they will have ecchymosis. So these things are very important. So this is a question on fundamental. They can connect it with anticoagulation. 45, 90 degrees, normal sub -Q, no massage, uh, no aspiration, and rotating the side is very important. Uh, and you have to know it's two centimeters from the belly button on either side, either left or right is reasonable uh, to give. Okay, um, so that is that. I call the antiplatelets. Now we have the anticoagulation, the blood clotting factors for you to clot. Well, antiplatelets, as you can see the name, they prevent the platelet from coming together to, to also clot. So um, there's two things that make you stop bleeding, and platelet and clotting factors. So this, usually they, if they, you don't want to affect the clotting factors, you can affect the platelet function. And I call my platelet function guy ADAPT as our name. Because they are difficult to remember, but you got to adapt to them. And how do you adapt to them? Well, just an acronym. And there's no a bunch of them. In the test, you don't have to remember what they are. Just look at the name. If one starts with A, it's aspirin or abysimab. You know, I don't know if you can remember it, but that's pharmacology. So you can use the word adapt, A-D-A-P-T. And the other one is diperidmodol. Those are all antiplatelets and pentazophilin and tacropidin. All of them, what they do is they affect certain portion of the platelets. You don't have to memorize them. Just find a way to remember them. When you see them, they are antiplatelets. Aspirin, I know we all know. And this one, if they ask you, I did not put it there, but you can also uh, put it there. Is is either it can be here, one of the A's, which is um, and Plavix. So you can um, put it there. So you can, oh no, you can put it in the P area, Plavix. But that's the name. They won't write Plavix. They will write this, Clopidogrel. So pro. Clopidogrel, you can put it over here. The, the, the reason why I don't put it here is the, the way I remember it is Plavix, but this is the same thing. The one they will put in your in your test is Clopidogrel, it's antiplatelets, that is Plavix, and that can also um, prevent um, a platelet coagulation, uh, uh, platelet effects. And the way to remember, so these are anti-platelet. They are not anti-coagulation. Uh, Somebody will say, okay, then what? Well, bleeding precaution is the same thing like we talk, we talk about. 
So no NSAIDs, uh, shaving, okay, uh, contact spots, um, they have bleeding issue. Specifically for these people, because they are antiplatelet, they make your platelet low. So thrombocytopenia. Um, so just know about that. For all of them, all of them, if patient had tarry black stool, anticoagulation, antiplatelet, that is not normal, that they bleeding. Tarry black stool, they always like asking you. A patient taking coumadin, heparin, lobanos, antiplatelet as tarry black stool, that is not normal. It's not expected. It's B sharp. They are hemorrhaging. That's a priority patient you see, or you intervene. You said stop your medication. Tarry blast tool means you're bleeding inside. We need to stop that. So don't forget. Tarry blast tool is no normal finding if you're on antiplatelet anticoagulation. It's a priority patient and it's a B sharp, and you need to do something about it. Pick that patient, it's hemorrhage. The last group is anti-thrombolytic. Uh, so they have last name as tepless, all of them. I just booked one. When you see tepless here, that's their last name. So when they give you something that is tepless, think as thrombolytic. They are clot bastards. These are the clot bastards. They bust the clot. A brain doesn't break the clot. What it does is it stabilizes it to prevent new formation of clot. That's what they do, anticoagulation. They stabilize it and they prevent it from growing and then prevent new formation, okay? These are what it will dissolve the clot. They bust them and dissolve them. They are poison and they're very, very powerful. And they have last name is Teplest. And usually you need them emergently, emergently. So they are what we call thrombolytic. So when you see them, yeah, that's what they're doing. There is a risk associated. Before we give you this, because you can bleed, they can make you bleed hemorrhage. You get stroke and everything. There is a contraindication for that. This is the same medication you can use for stroke. When somebody come in stroke, they have to be within that time. In stroke, it's like within four hours. In heart attack, like within um, a few hours. And so you have to pay attention to contraindication of anti-thrombolytic. So if they have uncontrolled hypertension, that's when you cannot use it. If they just had surgery, so recent surgery, it makes sense. All the answers make sense. They have recent surgery, they're going to bleed more. If they have recent uh, head injury, well, they're going to bleed more. This one, if you have AVMs, atrial venous malformation, arterial venous malformation, arterial venous malformation, they will, so AVMs, they will bleed more. So just um, these are, I'll just at least only four for you. This is because this is the most common one. Uncontrolled hypertension, recent surgery, recent um, head injury, AVM. And of course, if they're on other coagulation and they're already anticoagulated, that's a problem. You don't want to do that. So that's the anti-thrombolytic. Uh, Endocarditis, very interesting. Infectious one. So this is your heart, okay? And you have valves. The reason why this is very important is because it's, we see it all the time. We put IV in people. So we have IV, okay? We have another, go all the veins, we put IV in them. And so these IV get infected and you have bacteria travel all through the vein, through the vena cava and go to the heart. And then it deposit on the valves. Okay. This is what we call infective endocarditis. Endo means the heart, it, inside the heart 
Okay, the inside wall, cada is the the heart and hide is infection inside the lining of the heart. Okay, so the tissue lining the heart is infected, and it's because bacteria come out from outside. It can come from dental problem. It can come from um what do they call it? Um, having IV. IV is the most common. So peripheral IV, central venous IV, uh, peak lines can get infected and deposit the, uh, um, uh, uh, the bacteria in the valve. Guess what? This valve will make it away. Before that, the common place is on the right side. So the tricuspid valve, in case they ask you. The tricuspid valve is the common place. So the right side is where they deposit it. This will make their way somewhere. So these bacteria will do what we call emboli as the heart um, pump. So they can migrate from the heart and it can go any portion of the body, no matter what. It can go into your lungs. It can go into your brain. It can go into your skin. It can go into your toe. It can go into your finger. Anywhere. I mean, it can go into the kidney. It can go into your stomach. You can list it. It can get into your intestines. You see what I'm doing, pathophysiology. And you can find what kind of symptoms they're having just by that. And so that is what happened with endocarditis infectious. It's mostly bacteria. So um, who is likely to have that? Where somebody who have IV, so risk factors. So this is your SATA question right there. IV for a long time, that get infected. If you use drug, IV drug use, like cocaine, those shooting, you can have it. Or if you have infection somewhere that get into your blood. So bacteremia, that's what the scientific word, but, uh, bacteria in your blood. How will you be able to see it? There is vegetation, that's the right word. Vegetation. Something is growing on the valve. What do you think they can use to look at your heart? It's called echocardiogram. So you get echocardiogram and they can look at it and they can see the vegetation. Okay, the treatment is they need antibiotic for it takes a while to clear all the bacteria from the blood. So this is not something you give five days oral antibiotic, no. So no oral antibiotic. You need to clear all the infection in the blood. So they need an IV antibiotic for sometimes like six weeks. This is not perfect. They can have high risks of recurrence. It can come back again. And so you have to be monitoring them for a long time. Because of that, if they're going to have dental procedure, okay, you should let them have antibiotic so that they don't get infected again. The heart is already been infected with bacteria. You don't want them to have a second one. If they have a second one, it's a problem. So you want to prevent uh, recurrent infection as much as possible. And therefore, if they have dental procedure, they need antibiotic prophylaxis as soon as possible. It used to be colonoscopy. They need antibiotic prophylaxis. Some patients also sometimes request it, but just worry about dental procedure. For your test, you have to know how they present signs and symptoms for your SATA, okay? You need to know signs and symptoms for infectious endocarditis. Sorry. How, how does that, um, e, 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 what do they call it? How does that present? Well, the, when I was in medical school, there's a way we can, we, we rem I remember it and it's called from Jane, signed by endocarditis. So from Jane, sincerely from Jane. So that's the symptoms they have. So from the F is from Jane. So F is fever, it's endocarditis. So you're going to have fever. The R is road spot. 
in their mouth. R O T H spot. The O is the Oslo nodes. I will explain that to you. Um, then M, we have a, a mama on their heart. So you can hear a, a different mama on their heart. Then Jane, who is Jane? Well, Jane Wei, lesion. And the A is anemia. And the N is nail bed hemorrhage. And the E is emboli. So it's going away. So from Jane, I don't know what Jane brought us, but sincerely from Jane, that's the signs and symptoms of infectious endocarditis. And that can, that's a SATA question right there. So they have fever, they have rot spots. This is, like I told you, the emboli on the valve can get, no, the vegetation on the valve can emboli to any place they want. If you go into your retina, so this is retina hemorrhage. So retina hemorrhage, that's rod spot. So retina hemorrhage is here. The Oslo node, if you look at the, their finger, so if this is their finger, I'm not good at drawing. Yeah, at the finger, the tip of their finger, or if this is the toe, the tip of the toe, you're going to see, you're going to see uh, nodes. That one too is embolized. So this is originally fine on their finger. Uh, Erythema-like nodule on their finger, fingertips, okay? This is the fingertips and the tips of their toe. That is the Oslo node. And then the gem way is the palm and the sole. So this is the palm and this is the sole. You see hemorrhage. So these are all nodules, very tiny nodules. So they are all emboli. So that, that indicates the vegetation has embolized and they move to places that it doesn't want to go. So he has gone everywhere. So they have fever, rot spot, Oslo node, mama, genway lesion, which are on their palm and so anemia, and the nail bed. Yeah, he goes into the nail bed. So the nail, there is hemorrhage there. You see some erythema there. The other names they call this nail bed hemorrhage is splinter hemorrhages. So that's your SATA right there. So if you remember from Jane, you can get this done quickly. So fever, rot spot, Oslo node, so the, uh, mama, Jane anemia, anemia, nail bed, and emboli. The emboli still can go into your stomach and uh, intestines. It can go into the kidney. It can go into the lungs. They get a PE. Okay, so the, um, don't, don't forget about that. All this thing can happen. And then the atoll can get gangrene. You can, you can see dead tissue here. This is all expected finding. As you can see, all this is expected. The serious one, I think, is emboli to the lung or the brain. But nail bed, hemorrhage, splinter hemorrhage, if they, they give me a subtle question on this. The one I would choose as a priority is emboli into the lung and the brain. Fever, fine. Rod spot, okay. Oslo node, okay, on the toe. Mama, yeah. Gen way on the palm. Anemia, but this one is embolized to the lung and the brain is, is not good. So those are the one you, you pay attention. That become your priority patient. So from Jane is the symptoms of infectious um, endocarditis, okay? If the valve is infected, how do you, um, what do you do with it? So there's, uh, they may need surgery. And the way to which patient will undergo surgery is faces. Where um, the, the, the faces, P means 
they are they are prosthesists. That means their valve is um is mechanical valve, or if they have age, if they have a heart failure, okay, or if they have A, if they have developed abscess, and if they have S, if they have sepsis. These are the, some of the things we use when we medical school. So yeah, I remember all of them. E is if they causing emboli. If it's emboli into their brain, yeah, they need surgery. And as it depends on the size of the uh, vegetation. If it's a big vegetation, it continues co to cause this, this patient needs surgery. So these are all you need to know on uh, infect uh, infectious endocarditis. I don't want to bother you. Once again, from Jane, but if they give you to you and they ask you which one is the priority, I would check choose the embolization as the one. But from Jane is the symptoms of endocarditis and they need antibiotic for a very long time, like in six weeks. So this is the end of it. Um, thank you for listening. And this is really good stuff for um, anticoagulation for your test. If you know all of this, there's no sort of question I will beat you on this topic. Take care of yourself and keep charging and visit my YouTube channel and um, subscribe and like um, this video if you enjoy it. Take care of yourself and keep charging.